G.K. Edward Okba, a Nigerian-American Dallas resident since the late 1980s, is a husband, proud father, leader, public servant, global affairs advisor, and contrarian. With a successful track record in commercial real estate and economic development, he has worked on numerous domestic and international projects. His achievements include being the first foreign-born elected board secretary of the Dallas Black Chamber of Commerce in 1997. He has also served on the Park South YMCA board and raised over one million, earning him the Samuel G. Winstead Award from the Metro YMCA board. Today, EGK has welcomed Cheese into his home for an interview. I am honored to share his personal backstory and leadership philosophy with the world. I'm so excited today, everyone. I'm here with such a special guest. I've been waiting for this moment to have this interview with Mr. Ajike Okpa. Yes, thank you. Hi. Hello. It's really, really good to see you. Yes, I'm, I'm glad that when we met, which was, you know, during an event here, and, and you know, the friendship is, is just growing and glowing. So it is. thank you for, for that opportunity. It's always good to meet nice people who you share stuff, common values and aspirations with. So. I really appreciate it. And when we met, you gave me your card and you said, don't take my card if you're not going to use it. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> I guess I did. <laughs> I guess I know you, you followed did. up. You followed up. Yeah. I sure did. Yes. I, I, I wanted to because you were just such a respected person. And I really loved your excitement to be involved in politics. And, and also, your, I respected your experience in business. So. Well, you know, politics is something that we all, whether we like it or not, we get mm -hmm. involved. At the end of the day, this politics is about, okay, who is, whose position is going to prevail over, like, circumstances. And so when I came to America, um, or before I even came, my father told me, he said, don't just go to America for the sake of going to America. I should go to America if I want to get involved and be engaged. He said, nothing you will do in America would impress him they said that i'm engaged i'm involved and that's what i try to do you know my desire to be involved in the politics of things i mean the pop the community when I, mean, I ran for mayor 2003 dallas morning news did an editorial after you know the yeah. election yes yeah. and they said that they recommend I be involved in the regional politics. I mean, that's that's my news wow. editorial board, uh, board recommendation that I'm an open open comer. Wow. That's I thought I was already came, but I didn't know I'm still <laughs> But you know, I wasn't born here, so I can understand. Uh, but you know, you know, my part of Nigeria, my family name is known. If I were, if I had stayed in Nigeria, I probably mm -hmm. would have been running for something under that mayor. I can Probably. imagine that. <laughs> I know, can yeah, only imagine. My father was a chief. My grandfather was, I mean, you know, my family is known for public service. And that's interesting. I want to talk more about that because roots are so important to shaping our future, our destinies. And I love your story. So share. I'm very interested in just hearing you share more about your parents, the history, your values, how you were raised. Well, thank you for that. You know, who am I without my parents? You know, of course, God gives us life. For me, uh, my mom gives the first like, acknowledgement uh, for carrying me for nine months and then giving birth to me. And my father jumped up and died. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, my mom used to tell me when I was in her womb, I kicked her. But now that I've I'm out of her womb, if I misbehave, she's gonna kick me. She's gonna kick you. <laughs> so, so it's a turn back, turn people. Just don't, make, just, just don't let me kick you. Uh, so, you know, my dad was polygamous, many wives, so his chief at the time. But uh, so I'm my mom's only son, my father's oldest son. Wow. Um, my mom only had five of us, but I'm, you know, so I have seven sisters. So I was raised by my mom. My mom is the one that emphasized a lot of the values that drives me. My dad was just coming in and, uh, you know, I, I, I was in touch with him. I'd see him. It's not like he, he, I wasn't seeing him. 
But my mom was the one that taught me sense of responsibility, sense of accountability. You know, if I said a goal, go after it. Um, you know, about money, you know, um, don't, you know, don't spend more than you, you earn. Cut your coat. She Very used to say, so "Don't cut your coat according to your size." You know? Really? So, yes. <laughs> so, she was very wise. Yes. So she she told me about. He said, "You know, money is not about how much you have; it's the attitude towards what you have, because you can stretch it." And and and, and so that has stayed with me, um, wow. because you know, in these days, you know, we we buy and spend money on what we want and what we need, uh, and at the end, it, you know. At the end of it, we still not getting satisfaction out of how much, which, you know, if money is a tool to help you live a good life, for me, it's about the necessity I can have because money enables me to do it. I will never spend money or buy something I don't need. You know, I still have my 87 BMW that I bought when I came to Dallas. Really? Yes, I still drive it. Wow. And I could, I can go get another one and you know pick up the, as the many desk. as you want. If you want. Yeah, but, but you know, but that's the one. So I have to say, okay, I don't need anything else. My mom's brother had already come to the U.S. He lives in Richardson. Does he? Yes, my mom's. Brother, um, yes. So he came, and seventy-five. When he came, I finished high school seventy-seven, and he said, "Oh, because I made good grades." I could, I could come to America. Back then, it was easy to go. My father said, no, you're not going to America. And you did tell me that story. Yes, so you're and... not going to America. You're not appreciate <laughs> America if you're yes. at this age. Stay back in wow. Nigeria, go to college, understand who you are, and then when you go to America, you will have, you know, appreciate the country. I always believed my parents made good intentions for me. So I never questioned whatever it is they want me to do. I can come, I can come in with something, but I never questioned, I never doubted my mom, I never doubted my dad. So when he said that, I said, okay, fine. You know, went to college in Nigeria, outside of the part of Nigeria I grew up. And then, um, then 1985, 86, you know, my uncle said, hey, you still want to come? I, I asked my dad, he said, if you want to go, go for it. Wow. So, approval. <laughs> yes. And um, I went for the visa. I was denied visa the first time. I was denied visa the second time. Really? Yes. So the second time when I was denied visa, I asked the visa, you know, the consulate guy. So look, tell me what is missing in my application. So I don't waste your time. You don't waste my time. And if I can't meet the requirements, I'll just... I am not dying to go to America. I would love to go because it's a country that is the only country I want to go to. And the guy was like, okay, fine, I'll tell you what you need. <laughs> so, I like that, though. Yes. You make a good point. You asked. Yes. And she just gave you the information. She said, if you get me this document, you know, I'll, I'll mm. get a visa. I said, okay. Wow. So I went to the phone, called my uncle, and said, hey, I need X, Y, Z. My uncle said, oh, okay. He made it. Got the document, put it in a DHL, and sent it to me. Amazing. So I, I received it. I didn't even open it because I don't want them to think I, I went and forged something. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so I went back to them, you know, just walked in. And uh, so it wasn't the guy. I didn't see the guy that I saw the last time, but it was another guy. A different person. <laughs> and uh, I just say, he said, well, well, you know, here, you know, some time ago, or a week or so ago, I said, he yes, I was. You? He remembered me. I, I'm unforgettable. <laughs> 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 I'm forgettable. Yeah. You know, something about me, he would tell me that all the time. <laughs> so he said, okay, well, how can I help you? I said, well, I'm looking for this particular gentleman. I don't want to tell my story to her twice. Because it's like starting all over. Right. He said, okay, well, he's in the back. He's going to go get it. And he went in and the guy came out. He said, oh, you're here? I said, yes. He said, okay, what do you have? I gave him the, um, the DHL envelope. I haven't even opened it. He says, not open. I said, well, you open it. Whatever is in there is what, <laughs> is what you ask for. And he pulled it open, pulled out the document, and looked at his descent. You know, my uncle has sent that. He said, okay, where's your passport? My Nigerian passport. Right. I gave him an apple. He said, Have a seat. I sat down. Yeah. You know, five or ten minutes, he comes back and says, Welcome to America. I said, Where's wow. the visa? I said, Where's the visa? You yes. just a stamp, you know, sight. Right. He said, Yeah, you're ready to go. And you would do well in America. I like you. I wish wow. I had gotten that guy's name. Wow. And I said, Okay, thank you. 
I wasn't excited. I wasn't jumping up and down. <laughs> I just said, okay. And then I flew back to Enugu where my, my dad was. And I said, hey, dad, I got it. My dad shook my hand. He said, I know you are good. You know, first time you were denied. Second, I wanted to see if you were going to come crying to me. Wow. I said, no, dad. No, 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 no. You didn't raise me that. Yeah, I have to ex exhaust all the something. That's mm -hmm. how I got the visa, bought my ticket. And America, here, here I come. Wow. And I have stayed in the same zip code ever since. Question for you. Why Texas? Okay. You know, I'm, 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 I, was a good, <laughs> I was a good geography student. So I read, you know, economics of geography, anything to do with geography, about people. Geography for me is about the people, the place, and what they do. So I, I was reading my dad, so that getting me Time Magazine and Newsweek who buy stuff and give to me to read. Wow. So I was just reading. It wasn't like I was reading it to take a test, but you know, all of those things were getting embedded in my mind. So my uncle then was living here. Texas, which is in, in a like time farmer's branch. So, I, you know, I, was, I followed family. So I came, and then I came in August of that year. You and remember it was warm. the exact date? Yes, I know the date. Yeah. It was warm. So, from the end of the airport, you know, now you don't go to the gate. You know, back then, you know, you, you could, anybody you could could walk to, walk the gate, to the gate, to the gate, and <laughs> receive the passengers all the way. Right. So, I went through immigration, I got all that done. My uncle welcomed me and it was warm. And I said, Thank God, I'm never going to live here. I'm going to, I'm, this is going to be my home. I didn't even ask my uncle, Hey, how is this place? I said, Because it was warm, it felt like I'm in Nigeria, you know? Because mm -hmm. I thought America was a cold something. Did you? Yeah, because I mean, you know, you see, you see the people in, I, I never saw snow until I came to, you know. Oh, yeah, well, that's right. Yeah. So it was warm, and then when we drove out of the airport, I see this open field. You know, back back then there was nothing between the airport and 35. It was just little buildings here and there. <laughs> and I just looked, and the sky was blue, was nice. My spirit was good because I didn't feel like I'm, you know, this is, uh, I was new, but I didn't feel threatened or nervous. And I was like, this is my home. I would never leave. I'm going to stay in Texas, and I'm going to stay in Dallas. So you knew right away. I felt it. You felt it home. I didn't ask my uncle, well, how is it? You know, how is it? No. Mm -hmm. I have friends from my village, my my town I grew up in, city I grew up in, that were already here. You know, so it felt more like home. So when people telling me something, you know, I, I, I usually, you know, okay, fine. But I'm still going to go do it. <laughs> right. I'm going to go expose myself to it. You know, dating, getting a sure, job. Yeah. I was told at the time when I just came that was, nobody was going to hire me because I already had my college education in real estate. People told Someone me. Someone told you that. Yes. Wow. I'm glad Why you didn't people, listen you know, to oh, that. No, they're not going. I said, well, because my father taught me this. One plus one is two anywhere in the world. So the difference is the attitude. But you know what? I got my first real estate job. In 1987. Amazing. And, not and it was a white guy who yeah. hired me. And how he hired me, because at the time I was taking courses at the University of North Texas, which is back then was called North Texas State University. So I had met the professor, and one day I was frustrated, you know, because my first job was a boss boy at Anatole. And I was like, I didn't come to America to do this job. And I said to myself, two years when I came to America, if I don't get into real estate, I was going back. I was having this debate and conversation with myself. And then I talked to the professor. Hey, I need a job in real estate. Back then, 86, 87, 89, you know, the, the economy was, you know what it was. It yes. was just in the tank. He said, I am one of, I'm his best immigrant student really? because of what I have done, you know. So, well, congratulations. Well, thank you, I thank have you. to say that well, because you. you are a history maker coming here at 25 and making a decision that you knew where you were going. You had an idea that real estate was your goal. Yes. And you became the first. I'm, I was in, in 1992 yes. when uh -huh. you became law to yes. be certified as an appraiser in, in America. Wait, it was I, just becoming law? Yes, 1992. Wow. I was the first native African in the history of Texas to be certified as an appraiser. 
1992. I was one of the first uh, minority out of 21 in Texas to be certified. Congratulations. Yeah, That's I had, a you know, I'm a broker, real estate milestone. broker, and property yeah. tax consultant. I was a regional appraisal manager for Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Wow. But before I even became a citizen, I became a citizen in 1995. I've always been in the profession I went to school for. Always. You know, there are a lot of people that have default careers. That's true. They, they study something and they can't do it and they go somewhere. They're still making money. But I've always remained in the thing I went to school for. And you know why? Because my dad was in it. I showed him my father's business did. card. So did. when I even finished high school in Nigeria, I, I wanted to do architecture, law, or real estate. But I said, oh, no, I'm going to do real estate because it's my father. I'm a, I said, I want to be like my dad. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's why I went to real estate. That's why I went to real estate. Just and public service, too. And public service. It's you know? also following yeah. in your dad's footsteps. Yeah, but I used to go to my dad's office when I was six, seven years old, and I sit in his office, and then he would be doing wow. things. But then people came in Nigeria, real estate is a big deal, and they call them the landlord. Landlord. When you own a real estate in Nigeria, you're a landlord. landlord. You know, the land and the lord. <laughs> so I'll go to my father's office six, seven years old, sit in his office, and people are coming in, and he's addressing their need for tenancy, uh, uh, land acquisition, whatever the case that has to do with real estate. And as a child, I was like, damn, my father is God. People are coming to him for this. That's what I want to do. Six, seven years old. That is amazing. Yes, just looking you at my started, father doing that. You yes. started already connecting. Yes. With, my with father, yeah. Seeing my what your dad, yes. what your father did. Yes. I, okay. I, I followed him, if, you know. My father and I will have conversation. You know, sit down and talk. He never said, okay, you must you go to school for this. You know, he's always, are you learning something? He never said, what are you going to do? My father never asked that. He knew I was going to do something. He never asked me. So that's, that has been my courage, you know. And, but you know what? My mom gave me love. She was never harsh on me. She never criticized me in front of anybody. If I do something, say, explain yourself. Let me see if I can understand and reason why you might have done it. And I will really explain she said, okay, well, you shouldn't, but I don't want to hear this next time. I said, okay, mama. Mm. You know, that's, that was no. that was just her. You know, in the village, she would send me to go run errand. I remember one time, the first time, she's like, it's raining. And my mom said, oh, go over there and get me something. I said, mama, you know, it's raining. She's like, you think I don't know? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> And she's like, you're not a bag of salt. You're not going to dissolve in the rain. Just come on, go, go do it. <laughs> so. Okay, wait. On this subject, I have to... It reminds me of the time that we went walking yes. at White Rock and it was raining. Yes. And I said, hey, GK, it's, it looks like it's going to be raining. And you said the same exact thing. Yeah. And then I said... I guess I'm not a bag of salt. I probably, you know, I'll be okay. Yeah, you'd be okay. But it's funny as I'm hearing you say when mm -hmm. she learned from your mom, it's like you're able to carry those. Well, you know, so I, I went out and did whatever she wanted me. I forgot what it was, but I did it and came back and she, she, you know, touched me and said, "Now nah, see, you didn't dissolve. You still <laughs> you." <laughs> All she was getting to me was, "Don't have excuses when there's a reason to do something." Right. Because that could have been an excuse. Is running, and I'll just and change. just. Yeah. Not do it. Oh, so that's my mom. She taught me things with lessons, and I end up liking it. And I end up enjoying it, and I just laugh about it. You know, and, and she was very, she, I call her the dean of my life lessons. Like I said, she's the yes. dean of my life lessons. My dad taught me, you know, politics, confidence, stand up and speak. And, but my mom is more on this humanistic. I don't know, my dad, they're all both of same thing but my mom was more like caring for people mm. caring about myself she said don't ever try to help anybody if you're not strong so make sure that i'm strong before i can help anybody that's profound yes it's true he said no no don't let anybody jump on your back if you can carry them because both of you are going to do what fall and fall stay over. there absolutely so so so, so be strong in order to be helpful to anybody. Wow. And don't give anything that when you do it is gonna cause a problem for you. So very wise. 
Well, you know, she, I'm partial to my mom. <laughs> she's, 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 she's the wisest woman I've ever met. You know, in fact, my mom was the woman that, the only person that if I make a promise to, I'll keep it. If I promise my dad something, I don't care. But my mom, yes. I remember when I finished high school, I worked for a period before I, I went to college. And I said, the first salary I'm going to earn, I'm going to build a custom bed for my mom. And that's what I did. You did? Yes. Wow. I went to a custom maker, cabinet maker. I said, make one for my mom. Wow. She had a bed, but I said, because I said, I was going to do, do it. And I did yes. it. And she was like, you didn't have to do it. I said, well, it's too late. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm, I can, you know, I can write a whole book on here. Because I'm her only son, and she downloaded on me. A lot of stuff. I just enjoyed her lessons, the way, the way she put me through things. But it was always, always something that added to my values, my confidence, mm. you know, my ability to handle stuff, you know, having excuses. Yeah, it was just from her, you know. And then, you know, when I always wanted to please my mom, always, you know. And, um, you know, so my character in the village or in town, because I know people, you know, I'm the son of a chief. So people watched the, the son of a chief as he behaved, they back it. You know, so I made sure I was academically good. I made sure my character was right. I made sure, you know, I'm respectful and respectable, you know, when I'm out there. And so people in the village took to me. They liked me because, you know, yeah, we're going to tell your dad. And they would tell my mom good stories. You know, he came wow, into So amazing. my mom, like, smiled. She said, that's my son. That's my son. So I, I met two years before I finished high school. I said, Mama, I'm going to make grade one in my high school. Grade one in Nigeria is the best, you know, it's a very good grade. When you finish high school, you take a national test. Okay. You know. Because I want to keep my mom, you know, I said, Mama, yes. I'm gonna make grade one. She's like, okay. She did say, well, are you sure? Are you gonna do it? And she's like, okay. But it doesn't matter, just as long as you're learning something. I said, mama, I'm gonna make grade one. She, she never told anybody. So two years after I took the test, I made grade one. Really? Oh my God. My mom floated in the village, my mom, because oh. nobody's done it. And people were like, Mama AGK, AGK made grade one. She's like, yeah. And then she wanted to let them know. She said, yeah, two years ago, he told me. <laughs> <laughs> so she never forgot that no, she, she made kept it. She but she, was, she never even told my dad. She never told anybody. Oh, she just took it. And she said, yeah, two years. He told me, oh, I, mm. that, is, that is one gift. I, mean, I don't know, but my mom, mm. oh my God, that made her feel so good. First son, first in the village, first this, that, that, that. that. And the, so the day I told her, because I had to go get my result. So when I got my result, I came home, you know, to my father's compound to tell her. She just she laughed. She said, give up her um, that is, I told her. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yes. I love that story. Yes, she said. That's special. Oh, my God. And I she mean, was... after going through that, I could see how that could shape the rest of your your dreams. You, you, you decide, I'm going to achieve something, and it gets done. I went to the one I wanted. I've always gone to the school I wanted. <laughs> I never saw any castle. You know, when I was even at you had, you know, now UNT and TSU back then. You know, as a foreign student, you go through admission counselors and, right. and they tell you, okay, you know, you can go this way, you can go that way. So I was talking to this white counselor. She met good intention. She was doing her job. She said, well, you know, you can do computer. You can do this. And I said, ma'am, <laughs> tell me how to do the real estate that I want. I don't want to do computer. I said, the computer I want to do is the one that helped me do what I do. I'm not, and I'm not doing law. I'm not doing financing. I'm not divert, you know, diverted from this. And she said, oh, okay, okay. Foreign student? I said, no, real estate. 
Wow. Yeah. Very decisive. Yeah, about I mean, what I'm intentional. Wanted. I'm intentional yes. in my moves because I'm going to be the one at the end of the day is going to feel the pain or the gain. That's true. So if somebody's telling me be computer because they think, oh, that's the direction. You know, some people have done bad, you know, good with that, but I've always known what I wanted. Always. I, it's not a bragging yeah. thing. It's always in my head if I do it. And that's powerful to plant the seed. You know, it's, it's, look, God is a generous God. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's an impartial God. He puts things in us and he wants us to challenge ourselves to do it. And if you call on him, he's not going to disappoint. I think what's happened is a lot of us have imbibed this self-doubt. I don't know, maybe they're not going to like me, maybe nobody's done it. You know what I mean? You know, you start to defeat yourself before you even start to play. And that's what I see, you know, and that's like, no. God's not going to reward, nobody has 11 fingers. 11 toes, yeah, true. two heads. So it's the same in an anatomy that we have. But what makes the difference is how you reach inside yourself to ask yourself. You can do that by formal education or informal education or by observing. So a lot of people have surrounded themselves or have submitted to something to be subdued. I don't, I mean, I read the Bible when I was 17 years old. And I closed that book. I said, I will never read it again. And I have not. And what, what made you say that? Because I got it. Like, you know, my mom is like, you got to do it twice. You, know, <laughs> <laughs> I just, you just needed one chance, <laughs> one shot. I, I read it, got it for what it meant for me. Right. And how I'm going to use it. But I'm not a Bible-hugging guy. One day, my mom asked me a question. She said, how many people are important in my life? Is that a trick question? My mom always, you know, put me on <laughs> the trick something. I said, well, you know, I, I started off, because I was 11, 12 years old. I said, well, Jesus, God, I'm trying to find in the third one with a heart on my dad. Because <laughs> she always said three. <laughs> and I was like, and she said, stop it. Stop it right there. Okay. She said, no. Let me tell you the people that are important in your life. Me, for carrying you for nine months. Okay? You get that? Yes, mama. Your dad, for whatever he did for you to be in my womb for nine months. Okay? And you, you educate. Those are the people important. Whether I like Jesus or God, that's a given. Wow. Because I'm carrying you. I'm giving you food. I'm giving you shelter. So don't talk about Jesus and God. Me first. That's <laughs> okay. Wow. So, but you are also important in this tri triangle. So my mom never discussed Jesus with me, never discussed God with me. He said, you are accountable to yourself. I'm going to help you to where you have to now be accountable. You know, if I'm one year, two years, so she's, she's, she's going to be responsible for me. But once I get to that age, you are your own. Everybody needs a parent yeah. that says that to them. She said, okay, fine. You see, you see it's, it's in your trash or you're calling Jesus. Tell me, Jesus ain't coming to take the trash out for you. Of course not. So you may have a choice to make. I got it. GK, I just have to say that that is something that I really believe needs is needed in families today. You had a strong sense of identity planted in you. And I know it's uh, it's so simple and basic and we think that this should be happening with every kid, but it's not. Well, because, because you know, some t parents have surrendered to the authorities outside of them to raise their kids. You know, I think you and I talked about this uh, before you came. You know, Hillary Clinton, you know, popularized right. this, you know, I don't know where she got it, say, oh, an African thing. It takes a village. Mm. to raise a child right you know and uh, when, when i heard that i was like oh here comes a liberal woman trying to get everybody to think that's the way to go but my mom mentioned that thing to me she said the village didn't get me pregnant okay so they're not going to raise my kid 
I'm going to raise my kid. If I want the village, I will fight them. So when Hillary is talking about it, text, if I said, what African village? You didn't talk to my mom because my mom would have told her, I said, heck no. <laughs> <laughs> I raise my child because it's my responsibility and it's my duty. So we have to be responsible for our children. We we it, when children come from homes that have that love, and care because the first authority figure a child is going to have is, is, is the mom or dad or whomever is over them at that time. And if they don't respect that person or that person don't teach them lessons, then you know this, the kid is going to go out there and start to stumble, you know, stumble and what am I, what direction, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. You know, children are like uh, seeds, you plant them and then the seed pops. So the farmer comes in to tender them. The stem, the branches, give them the support for them to do, keep sprouting. If you don't do it at that stage, they're falling all over, they're falling apart, That's they're true. falling here and there. So we have left that initial responsibility of giving a support to that seed when it pops from the ground. So that now it can become a tree with strong stem and then branch off. I don't want people telling me something because they read a book. And that's what we've become experts, but we haven't really become human. That's because there's a checklist. Point. There's a checklist. Do this, do that. Right. You do this. Do you say, I love you every time? Do you send flowers? My mom said, my love for you is a given. I ain't going to tell you I love you every day for what? <laughs> and she's true. It's true. She's like, what is the thing? I love you every day. For me, carrying you, giving birth to you, and raising you the way I, that means love. So don't expect me to say it. Wow. My mom never said, oh, Ejika, I love you. But the way she reacted and responded to me, I don't have to question it. She's such a strong woman. And if you had, I mean, just thinking about how much of an influence she had with you. How did it shape your parenting with your kids? You know, my kids are with my ex-wife, you know, so I didn't have the opportunity of, you know, mm -hmm. being physically present, but I, I, I played my role. Mm -hmm. I spoke with them. I took them around and mm -hmm. showed them who, you know, what I believe and, you know, um, I still leave them to be able to do their own thing. So I, I have I have good uh, relationship with them. But you know, it, 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 it would have been different if we all grew up you know, around mm -hmm. me. But, but you know, but um, I you know, I I speak to them, I ask them questions like my parents mm -hmm. would ask me, what are you doing? What do you want to do? Is there anything I can do yes. to, to step in on your behalf or something? And they've always said, no, my son, for instance, doesn't eat like I do. I, you know, once a day is my, my eating habit. I don't eat in my car, and my son doesn't do that. And it has no tattoo. It has no athletic heroes or entertainment. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, he's okay. He's, 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 you know, I like, hey, thank you, you know, for that. But he has to still live his life because he's born here. Right. He's not born in, you know, in the... In the, in the typical or traditional village mm -hmm. that I, I mean, a town I was born. I wasn't really born in the village. I was born in the city, but most people would say village because mm -hmm. village is strong for us. You know, when somebody says, oh, my village is where your roots are from. So I was born in the city, Enugu, but I claim my father's village because wow. that's where yeah. I go to my father's grave, grandfather's compound is still there. Today? Yes, still there Sick. today. I, my, father, my grandfather's house is still standing. I'm going to renovate it and keep mm -hmm. it the way it is. Uh, it's, it's one of the oldest buildings in my village, my grandfather's really? house. Yes. Uh, I grew I, 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 live, I, I live in that house. My grandfather, you know, okay. Here's something that is shocking. <laughs> Ebos, we bury people in our compound. So when you walk into those compounds, you are mm -hmm. tiptoeing. Because mm -hmm. there are... You know, we don't mark the grave, but they are, they are there. Uh, and we don't sell them. Nobody buys it because... No one wants... But it's not there. Or the, it's not there. It's not there yet. So if everybody in that compound dies off, then trees grow over it and it becomes a forest. Interesting. Yes. 
But nobody claims Alala Abad is compound. <laughs> nobody fights wow. about it. I mean, this is Igbos, you know, yes. Yorubas are different and other people. But my grandf my father-in-law just passed away. I mean, he, he, he wanted to be buried in his village, and that's where he was buried. He went to school here. He, was, he got educa education in America, but he died, and he said, bury my For most people, it's the biggest honor. But yeah. they left from here, and they came back there. So there are Igbos here. When they, bury, when they died, they said, take me back there. And they buried them. I did not know that. Oh, yes. Thank you for telling me that. Oh, yeah. We we don't play with our compounds. In fact, <laughs> if anything come up with our challenges, we will kill you. Like, what? <laughs> so, so, so that's just the, that's just the thing. And, you know, look, I appreciate you taking your time on Saturday like this. I know you would have gone to do your, your nail, but I know you went to do your hair. Because <laughs> I know black women have your hair. <laughs> it's just it's a big thing. Uh, but you, you, you know, you decided to come, and I really appreciate it. And you know, anybody who can, who makes me to cry, you know, shed tears about mm -hmm. my mom, is there to me. Mm -hmm. 